We've been going through John. Hope you've been able to read on your own at home. This morning we're going to talk about uh, the fact that only God can heal. Two healings in the book of John, chapter 4 and 5. It involves trust. It involves trusting Him. First, I want to um, do this. I've got to use the technology. That's uh, always a challenge. Let me see here. Um, there we go. So I'm going to give you some pictures. I I'm on. The bottom. It's got to be green. Okay, I got green. I'm good. It was red. That's not good. So I want to give you some pictures to look at. I want you to tell me what you see, and then there's an association between these things. I want you to tell me what that is. No? There we go. Now, I'm not worried about the people on the sidelines here. I want the guy in the middle. <laughs> what? Ah. <laughs> Native American, yes. That you got it. Any particular thing about that? He's over a guy. Do you see that? Well, not a witch doctor. That's coming up. <laughs> a medicine man. There is the um, other guy you talked about. We're, we're now in Africa. If you can see the skulls down at the bottom. Let me see. Right there. And uh, so we're in Africa, and this guy is a witch doctor. How about, um, wait a second, this guy. You recognize him? Who's that? Gunsmoke, and his name's Doc Adams, I believe, right? So it might date some of you. Maybe you don't even uh, remember this. There's a stethoscope in that guy's hands there. How about this guy? A little more modern. It's Bones, right? Dr. McCoy from Star Trek. So, so all these guys have something in common. Okay, well, the, I don't know that you call the, the African guy exactly doctor. They're healers, right. right. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to talk about me right now. <laughs> One of my favorite pastimes, I want to talk about me. Because I'm a healer, right? And... Um, I have something in common with these guys. You know, I was in the nursing home last week, and, and, a, and an old guy that I'm seeing, he has terrible hearing, and I was, I was trying to talk to him, and he was telling me, I'm a quack. <laughs> you're, a, you're a quack, he told me. So I'm not sure about this healing stuff, but we're going to talk about it. So one thing I've, I've mentioned before is, one of my favorite things in all the world is is um, when you have a really good abscess. It's red and hot. Now, it's not good for the person. I'm not saying that. It's painful. It's yucky. But but in a, in a moment of time, you can lance that and you can make it better. Right? <laughs> I, I, I even say that, you know, it, there's nothing like a good abscess. <laughs> but... But it's not because of the pain, it's because it's, it's immediate satisfaction. It's like you can make that better. And, and it's, yeah, it's pretty easy to solve, right? What if you have a, I, I've had kids with these, they come to me and their arm is like, it's broken, clearly. Setting bones is like that too. 
probably never experienced that, but there's this wonderful rush that comes on as, as you feel crunch and it goes right back in place. It's like immediately things are better. That's a, that's a good thing, right? Or you have, you have a skin cancer. And isn't cancer kind of like, it's, it's a little picture of sin in the world. I mean, it's there and it's chaos and it's destructive and it's yucky. And, and you can cut it out in just a few minutes and be gone with it. And the world's a better place, right? <laughs> After that. But just... Um, so you don't give me too much credit. That's not exactly the way it works, does it? I mean, yes, I can do the things that I mentioned to you, but I'm really more of a helper than a healer, right? Because I can lance the abscess, but God brings in, he causes the immune response, and he brings in macrophages and leukocytes, and he fights off the infection. He gets rid of it, and he heals that. And I can put bones in close proximity and headed the right direction, but I can't cause those bones to mend. You've got to have osteoclasts and osteoblasts, and they come in and they, they mend that and take off the rough edges of the bones that are still broken, and they put it together. And that, those skin edges, when you take out that cancer, they're together, but I don't heal that. God causes cells to move in and place collagen and fibroblasts to heal that incision and to take care of that wound. And in fact, it's God who actually heals cancer, isn't it? It's, and sometimes he causes it to remain. Hmm. He's the ultimate healer of every sickness, the mender of injuries, the one who gets rid of cancer completely. It's... It's him. You know, I'm kind of like the, the mechanic who has the dented car that comes in. The old car, and you put Bondo and some paint over it, and you can make it look better. And, and I can do that. And, and if you're in, listening to this illustration and you're my patient, I don't want to imply that you're an old car in this illustration. <laughs> but God can recreate anything, even, even our earth's going to be recreated. Our, our souls are recreated. It's a complete renovation. It's completely new, and it's not Bondo. It's perfect. You know, um, we're going to read about two physical healings, and they're amazing, both of them. A child and an old man. And we're in John chapter 4. So if you want to turn to John chapter 4, we're going to look at verse 43. It's in the book of John. Pastor told us a little bit about this last week. And he said uh, this statement, it's not about, it's not about me. It's about him. Exactly. And that's... Um, Pretty consistent through this book. God's chosen to communicate with us. He didn't choose a movie or a tape or sky writing, but he chose a person, Jesus Christ, to communicate as the Word. He is embodies the Word to us. And he's made flesh and blood, and he came to be with people. He brings life, which is truth, and he brings physical and spiritual life. So let's look at, um, well, let, let's think about this first. The first miracle that he did was in cha John chapter 2, and it was a wedding feast. He uh, goes to this celebration. What a, you know, what better way could there be to start than to go to a celebration, to go to a wedding? And he rejoices with these families, and he turns water into wine for them. It's a blessing, and it's it's upbeat, and it's it's rejoicing. In contrast, this second miracle is on the darker side. I mean, this talks about 
the human experience of suffering and illness to the point of a critically ill child. You know, we live in a fallen world. We all deal with physical problems, physical illnesses, um, other maladies. That one time or another, we all deal with that. This pa passage is meant to um, encourage us. So let's look at verse 43 of chapter 4. Jesus had been at Samaria where they were glad to have him. At first, maybe not, but uh, they listened, and uh, many people were saved. They honored him, and now he comes back to his home turf, to Galilee. And, and how's, how does that go? Look at verse 44. What does Jesus say? A prophet has no honor in his hometown. Now, now, he's coming to the region of Galilee, and what was his hometown? Where was that? It was Nazareth. He doesn't go back to his hometown, in fact, but he comes to the region of Galilee. And there, they welcome him. But it's not exactly maybe for the right reasons, more because he's the local boy made good. He's LeBron James returning to Cleveland, you know. He's, he's famous. He's done some miraculous things. They like that. He's a celebrity. Verse 46, he comes to Canaan where he did this first miracle, turning the water to wine. And there's a government official there. And he comes from Capernaum, 16 miles away. And he's a government official, so he could have sent a representative to do this. He could have... Um, ordered someone else, he could have ordered Jesus to come with him. He could have sent a military uh, brigade and brought him back. But he doesn't do that. He comes himself. And how does he come? Does he order Jesus to come? He begs him to come. He pleads with him in humility because he'd heard about Jesus' ability to heal. And uh, how sick was this man's son, verse 47? He was near death. As sick as you can get. He needed intensive care, but they didn't have intensive care. So the man, the man is desperate. So what does he want Jesus to do? He wants him to come back with him to Capernaum. Because in his mind, just like in these pictures, the doctor's got to be present, right, for the person to be healed. In his mind, he's got to be physically there for this to happen. It's logical. He didn't understand that Jesus could heal with a word as... We read in other places about the centurion who says, you don't need to come, just say the word, and it'll happen. Then Jesus, he makes kind of a strange statement, but it's, and it's a rebuke. He says this, will, will you never believe in me unless you see miraculous signs and wonders? Now, now to this man who's desperate, I don't think, uh, we'll see, he doesn't really heed that. I think to the people around him, the Jews required a sign, and it wasn't just this man. It was the whole people. They were caught. They needed signs to believe. So this speaks to more than just this man. He doesn't seem to hear the rebuke. He keeps pleading, verse 49, Lord, please come now before my little boy dies. And he doesn't believe in resurrection, never seen or experienced that before, so that's not a possibility. I can't have him die and have him bring him back. But there seems in this passage that there's a progression of faith for this man. 
First, he believed that Jesus had some kind of miraculous power to heal his son. Some magic that would work. But his faith changes and it grows through the process of this passage. In verse 50, Jesus tells him, go home. Your son will live. And in that statement, there's incredible mercy in this healing. A, a son close to death, a father at wit's end. Jesus has pity on him and heals his son. It's loving, but he has a bigger goal. Jesus has a bigger goal. For many, this statement, uh, go home, that's probably all they'd hear, right? You'd listen to that and say, oh, you know, I've got to do something. I, uh, if he's got to be physically present to heal my child and he's telling me to go home, I, I better get the troops. Or maybe just dissolve in a heap and give up. He's as good as dead. But this man does neither of those things. He believes Jesus. He believes, and there's no reason he should believe Jesus. He's never seen this before, but he believes Jesus. His word alone. So he starts home. And you know, if you think about this guy's trip, I think there was a little difference between the trip there and the trip home. Because if you can think of, of your son or daughter being close to death and you're desperate, and I mean this is a frantic thing, you've got to find this guy and get him back there as soon as you possibly can. But on the way home, he had trusted what Jesus said. and I think there was calm. And, and he was, it was easy. And, you know, he couldn't see that his son had made any improvement. He wasn't there. But he trusted Jesus and he believed what he said. And then uh, verse 51, it's very kind. His servants come to him because they know Good or bad, this man would really want to know how his son's doing. Any change in his condition. And, it, you know, it wasn't that they hadn't expected, uh, you know, in this culture, a child like this, we've experienced that. We've been to Africa where the, the mortality rate for kids less than five is about 30% when we were there. And so they, are, they experience a lot of death, is what I'm saying. They see it a lot. They know it. They know it when they see it. And I'm sure these people were expecting, this boy's going to die. They're just sure. It's like that in Capernaum, just like in Africa. He may be worse. They've seen hundreds of times before death. But they come with good news. He's made a complete turnaround. They're overjoyed to tell him, your son lives. But the official, you know, when he went out, he was desperate, but now he looks different. He's kind of calm about this. And the servants can see that, I'm sure. He doesn't seem surprised at the news. How could this be? We have... a. We've seen many before this child, like we said, die. But he simply asks a question. And it's not the question you'd expect. You'd think he'd say, you know, when he, how's he doing? When he woke up, did he, did he mention me? What did he say to you? No, he, he asked this question instead. He says, when did the boy get better? And they said yesterday at 1 o'clock. The exact hour, Jesus had made the statement, your son will live. So this man's, um, he understands that Jesus has real power. It's been confirmed with what he's heard. It's like all fits together. He's got power over life and death. My son was almost dead and he healed him with a word spoken 16 miles away. And his response, he believed. This time, he wasn't just believing in a miracle, but he believed in, in Jesus' person, in who 
he was. And, and his, he convinced his whole house. I think that includes his servants. They all believed in Jesus. The official had moved from trusting miracles to trusting a person, the person of Jesus Christ, as his Lord and his God. And this is salvation. It's spiritual life from death. Now, he's experienced the same thing almost that his son went through, only more. He's gone from death to life spiritually. As we read in the Gospel of John, a hundred times it uses the word pistuo. It's the Greek word for believe. I think that's a common theme here, trying to get something across. Exactly. So this is the second miraculous sign in the book of John. There are eight total. And we're going to look at the um, third one. So let's look now at John chapter 5. We're going to look at a second instance. Jesus returns to Jerusalem to a place, a pool called Bethsaida. Now, in these verses, in some of your Bibles, um, they may have present uh, a little section. It's been taken out of some Bibles, verse 3 and 4. And the reason for that is when they looked at this, they found that the Greek words used and the phrases were totally different than John had used in any of his other writings or even in the New Testament. And what they think happened is they think a scribe added those words to explain this passage. Here's the words that are omitted. Um, Waiting for a certain movement of the water for an angel of the Lord uh, came time to time and stirred up the water. And the first person to step in after the water was stirred was healed and whatever disease he had. So we think they copied that in the margin to give extra understanding to this passage. But it's not really part of the Bible. The best manuscripts do not have that. So that's why in, in mine it's omitted and put at the bottom. It may be in yours or it may be there in some versions. This idea of angelic stirring has, is nowhere else in Scripture. It just doesn't exist there. Even in ancient writings of uh, Jewish history, there's no mention of this. So let's look at uh, John chapter 5, verse 1. Jesus returns to Jerusalem for a festival. And there's three big festivals which men were required to go to, and we think that it's one of those. We don't know which festival it was. A lot of people think it was Passover. The three are Passover, Feast of Tabernacles, and let's see, Pentecost. So there's a pool, and it's near the northeast gate of the city's wall in Jerusalem. It's called the Sheep Gate. It's mentioned in the Old Testament. There's this pool called Bethsaida, and that word itself means house of mercy. Really interesting that it means that, because that's what we're going to see here. And there's these, what they call them porches, five different kind of uh, roofed walkways that are present. And there's crowds of sick people that are kind of waiting in these different parts. Um, they could be kept out of the weather, but there's crowds of people who are blind and lame and paralyzed. And it must have been a popular place, obviously, with the crowds there, and there must have been a good reason for that, right? There must have been in, these, in this pool some kind of healing ability. It talked about this water that turns up a, a kind of like a spring and it has some medicinal value. It helps to heal people. We're not told that it's miraculous healing here, though. Verse 5, the man lay, may be laying for some time. He's been paralyzed for, uh, this one old man has been paralyzed for 38 years. Almost four decades. Now, it doesn't say he was laying there that whole time, but it says he was sick for that long. 
Jesus um, did not, not ask him anything. He knew by looking at him or divine knowledge that he'd been sick for a long time. See, God as a healer, he doesn't shy away from difficult cases. He takes on the tough ones, and he's able to handle it. So he asks him a question. Would you like to get well? <laughs> now, in this man's situation, in our vernacular today, what do you think he would have said? Duh, right? <laughs> like, really? You think, uh, of course, this is Jesus. I don't think you'd say duh to Jesus, would you? You wouldn't really say that. But he didn't know that, so maybe, maybe today he would have said that. He, of course, wanted to be healed. So his response, he says, you know, I can't, I can't get in the pool, and nobody will help me get in there, and that's the way I'm going to be healed. That's the way he understood it. So, so I'd like to, but I can't. Somebody else keeps going in ahead of me. And that must have been fun, right? You can't move, and you're there for healing, and people just keep going in the water and coming out. They're better, and I can't get in. For years. Frustrating. So, you know, there's another reason Jesus asked this question, do you want to be healed? It's hard to fathom, maybe, but did you know that there are sick people who actually like being sick, that like play the role because they get something out of that? It's kind of a meal ticket sometimes. People who would say no to this. No, I'm, I'm okay. I'm glad to have other people serve me. This works, being a beggar. Leave me alone. I'm good. He doesn't say that, but there are people, even today, right, that do that, that live there. It's sad. Verse 8, Jesus told him, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. A command. And so does he um, go over to the pool to be healed? No, no, he just gets up. And is it, you know, as I look at this and I think about a guy who's been paralyzed 38 years, I see little atrophied limbs and I see, you know, joint contractures like you're not going to be able to move your knee. And if you did stand up, it's like that'd be a new experience. It's like you'd probably be pretty shaky and wobbly and unsteady, disequilibrium. Do you see any of that here? No, it's like he gets complete muscle back to his legs. The contractures are gone. He's up. It's not like the little fawn who's just been born, who's shaking and weak. And, you know, he gets up and gets his mat, rolls it up, walks off with it. He's immediately, completely healed. And that's the nature of God's healings. We see a lot of faith healers today that do some kind of partial or long-term healings. Jesus heals completely. And, and as we see this scene, it's like, oh, happy day, you know? Like, this guy's been down so long. He's been paralyzed, and he's healed. He's made whole. I'm telling you, if this happened at our hospital, there'd be news out about it. We'd rejoice. People should praise God for his kindness in this situation. But the Bible adds this. The miracle happened on the Sabbath. Hmm. Well, holy day, healing, that shouldn't matter, should it? But the Jewish rulers objected. They said to the man, the law does not allow you to work on the Sabbath. The law does not allow you to carry that sleeping mat. Was he working? It was his sleeping mat. I mean, he's just, and is he a rich man? Like, this may be his only possession. So he's rolling up this thing to keep it. Somebody else going to take it. Is that work? I don't think that's work. I don't think it even applies to this. 
But they apply it to this because they're upset. They're ticked off. Somebody broke our rules, and it wasn't the rules of the law. It was There were extra rules, rabbinical rules that were added to the law. There were 39 different things that you weren't supposed to do. And this would be carrying something. That was one of them. And this guy, you know, how would he respond to that? I, really? I've been, been sick for four decades, and you guys should be dancing and shouting and celebrating. Not these guys. They're all about the law, about the rules. And I'm sure he's thinking, you know, this guy came up and told me to get up. I've been down for 38 years, and he, like, totally restored me. He told me to carry my mat. I'm carrying my mat. <laughs> That's all there is. I'm going to listen to him. He's got authority over disease and sickness. I'm listening to this guy, not you. But the ruler said, verse 12, who told you such a thing? Who told you to do this? They didn't care about the man. They didn't care about his paralysis for a very long time. They didn't care about the miracle before their eyes. Should have brought them to their knees. They should have been praising God. And what is the summary of the law anyway? To what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Now, how'd they do on that? Hmm. They weren't really loving God. They weren't even looking at God here. They're totally caught up in the rules. And so they miserably miss that. And what about loving their neighbor as themselves? How did they do with that one? If any of them had been paralyzed and they were miraculously healed, it would have been front page news, right? All the Pharisees and religious rulers would be out there. No. They'd be leaping and jumping and praising God if it was them. They don't even think about this guy. Verse 13, the man didn't know who healed him. That's interesting, isn't it? Because this sure isn't an episode where it's his faith that made him whole. He didn't even know. There are some in the church who blame the sick person. They say, you know, this, you sick person like um, Johnny Erickson Tata, who's had the spinal cord injury, she went for healing. And, and they said, you know, you just don't have enough faith. That's cruel. That's harsh. And it's a lie. It's just not true. God heals people. He's in charge of it. This man has no faith. This was done to him. He did respond and pick up his mat. That's true. What else are you going to do with new legs? You've got to get up. You're not going to stay down. You're going to walk. So now, after this incredible miracle, where was Jesus? Is he gathering people to tell them about this amazing thing that he's done? No, it says he slipped away in the crowd. Humility, front and center. He's not trying to make a name for himself at this point. You know, there come a time when the crowds would gather and get together and they call him the Messiah. Multitudes in Jerusalem bowing down and praising him, but it's not yet. This point in John is a turning point in this book and in the Gospels. It's a turning point because the attitude changes. The attitude before this has been some reservation, but now it's outright rejection. They reject him. The heat's on. Jesus is the object of these religious leaders' hostility. From this point, they will hate him. So does he leave Jerusalem and hide out? I mean, bad things are going on. 
if I'm going to stay on till later. Now, he comes back to the temple, to the guy. <laughs> Verse 14. And he warns him. This is interesting. He warns him, now you're well, so stop sinning, or else something worse may happen to you. You know, in sickness, there's different causes of sickness. Apparently, what caused this guy's sickness? His sin. Because Jesus tells him, stop sinning. Now, that's not true of all illness. We know Job was a righteous man. He has terrible things. He's covered with boils. And it wasn't because he sinned. So we, that's not always true. But sometimes that's true. Jesus rebukes this guy. Tells him he needs to make a turn. And if you don't, what's going to happen? It's going to get worse. Can you imagine? He's been paralyzed for 38 years. How could it get worse than that? But apparently it could get worse here on earth. Of course, there's also this idea that um, if you persist in your sin, um, James talks about the fact that sin, when it gives birth, brings death. So eventually you experience this separation from God, which is eternal death, which is hell. He would be looking at that, too, if he doesn't turn. That's the ultimate worst-case scenario, hell. Verse 15, then the man went immediately and told the Jewish leaders it was Jesus who healed him. Hmm. You know, he didn't have to do that. He could have slipped away, but he chose to do that. Um, and there's, boy, if you read the commentaries there, across the board on what this means. MacArthur says this, this is the greatest act of ingratitude and unbelief in Scripture. Pretty strong statement. I'm not sure about that because, you know, I don't know if he understood the full impact of what he did. He may have been a people pleaser with these uh, religious leaders and he wanted to gain their favor by telling them this. That's possible. He may have been mad at Jesus. I mean, he just rebuked him for his sin. He may not have liked that. Or he may have been just a simple man and they had asked him to find out the name of this guy and he went back and told them very possible that's what he was doing. I don't know his heart. So they had said, tell us the name, and he does that. You know, from this point, if you look at verse 16, we know the outcome. The Jewish leaders began harassing Jesus for breaking the Sabbath rules. Jesus responds. Jesus always has a great response, doesn't he? My father is always working. So simple. My father's always working, and so am I. You know, God the Father has been constantly at work since creation. He brings out this idea, you know, God created in six days and he rested on the seventh day, but that wasn't all there was because God's been sustaining the universe. He is constantly at work. He works to keep things running. He works in our lives to keep us running. And he works in the world. He's got um, things under control, even though there's a lot of chaos around the world, isn't there? God's at work. He sustains every atom. He maintains the universe. And Jesus says, I do that too. In Colossians 1.17, it says, He holds all creation together. There's a force physicists don't understand inside of an atom that would cause it to fly apart. Some particle, some force. They don't understand. It's, it's Jesus. It's God. He's not far off and uninvolved 
but very actively at work in the world and in us. So as Jesus speaks this statement to the Jewish rulers, they became even angrier. And they tried all the harder to find ways to kill him. And there's two reasons. One, he broke the Sabbath. We've said that. But he also calls God his Father. It says, making him equal with God. So this was blasphemy. Now, did they twist his words? Did they make them out to be something they weren't? No. He says the absolute truth. There are people that try to say that Jesus never claims to be God. And I'd say, boy, they just need to read the New Testament because it's pretty clear here. He says he's like God, equal to God. They were right. And it says it over and over again, and it's because he is God. So, some practical truth about believing. Uh, unfortunately, most people don't, right? They don't believe. It says, for many are called, but few are chosen. It's a tragic truth, but it's absolutely true in the world that we live. The way to, to hell is wide. The way to heaven is narrow. But this unbelief, this rejection is a damning sin. He does not... Uh, he who does not believe in Christ, it says, has been judged already. If you reject him, there's no hope. At its core, unbelief is a rejection of Jesus Christ, who is the truth, and he's God in human form. That's John 14, 6. The people of Israel rejected Jesus' miraculous signs just as they had similarly rejected God's works throughout the Old Testament, right? They rejected the prophets. They rejected God's working, and they're doing the same thing still. There's different levels of unbelief, and you see a couple of those here in this passage. Um, we would see first unbelief due to a lack of evidence. This guy who came, the official, uh, he hadn't had any experience before. Those he needed to see the works of Christ. And he had heard his, um, after he had seen that his son was healed, and s seen the power of Jesus and his word, he would believe in Jesus. He needed to be exposed and have evidence. And he acted on it. Where else do we see unbelief in this passage? It's pretty clear. Who else shows that? The Jewish rulers, right? They're, and the Jews themselves, they're religious and self-righteous. They're deliberately hard-hearted. Jesus says this in John 8, 24. He says, Unless you believe that I am who I claim to be, that's God and the Messiah. Unless you believe that, you will die in your sins. There is no hope for you if you do not believe that. So, that's unbelief. Jesus is God, and He's also sovereign. We see that here in this passage too, right? We see a whole crowd of sick people, blind, lame and Jesus comes to one guy, this paralyzed guy, and he heals him. He could have chosen to heal them all, but he chooses this one man, and he chooses, you know, um, you think he could have chosen a different day? You think this guy was going to be around on the next day or the day after that? But he chose the Sabbath to come. He does that to confront these Jewish rulers. That was his intent all along. It wasn't he was, that he was surprised by that. He wants to confront legalism, and he does that. And he wants us to see love. Love for a person over rules. Man-made rules. And we do that at times, don't we? We live by our rules instead of loving other people. And it keeps us, it keeps us from loving other people. So he chose to heal this old man alone out of the crowd of sick people. 
Uh, and did you see anything good in this old man? Anything that commended him to God? Was he righteous? It just says he was paralyzed, and he'd been there a long time. There wasn't anything. Was there some spark of good or faith in him that he expressed? You can see. No, in fact, he didn't even have faith after he was healed. Except he got up. He did get up and carry his mat, an act of faith. He listened to what Jesus said. He does this with new strength, and Christ has provided him a recreated body now. And, and whenever God commands something, he always enables that command. That's cool, isn't it? You see commands in the New Testament for you, telling you to do things? God enables what he commands. He will give you the strength to do what he says. You know, it's a lot like our salvation. If you're saved, you're given new life in, in uh, Christ. God chose you, and he shows you mercy. Did he do that because there was some good in you, some spark of faith? No. It was simply because he loved you, and he chose to show mercy to you. That's the way he works. You know, Jesus, um, did you know Jesus when he called you? I kind of knew about him, but I didn't really know him. We were lost in sin. I was lost in sin, pretty much about my own things. And he called me. And I, did you respond in faith? Did you believe in him? Have you trusted him? Help me out here. There should be a little more response than this. When Jesus called you, when he, when he asked, uh, said to you, do you want to be well? Did you respond to that? Wow, it's pretty weak still. Help me out. Yes. Thank you. Even our faith that we uh, believe with, it's, it's a gift, we're told. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. I can't boast about it. It's God-given. Just as He chose this poor, paralyzed man, so He chose you, if you're a believer in Jesus. In, in this passage, there's evidence this man didn't come to saving faith. We don't know for sure, but I don't see any evidence here. There's physical he healing, but no spiritual regeneration. And God is sovereign. He is sovereign over healing physical bodies, and He's sovereign over healing souls. The purpose, um, let me close, the purpose of this book of John and this passage is, is this. We said that this one word was used a hundred times in the book. Do you remember what that was? Believe. A stool. So when you believe for the first time, if you're an unbeliever, it applies to that. We want you to, uh, for unbelievers, we want them to trust God. If you're here today and you have not trusted in Jesus, we want you to entrust your life to him and follow him, to understand that you're a sinner, that you're headed for judgment. We've all been headed for judgment, but Jesus stood in your place by dying on the cross. He took the penalty of your sin to heal your soul, to bring life to your dead spirit, to bring forgiveness instead of guilt, righteousness, even his perfect life. Now, that's, that's hard to fathom. I have to sit and think about that, and it's good to do that, but I have to think about the fact that Jesus lived perfectly and completed everything he needed to do in the law, all of it, before God, and he gives that to me. So as I, I stand here now before God, I have a perfect standing. I'm good. God's satisfied with me. What a, what a blessing. If you're discouraged, think about that. In place of all my sin and my failure, I have perfect standing through Jesus. You know, is there anything um, here for believers? If we read the purpose statement of this book, John 
chapter 20, verse 31. It says this, but these are written, these things in this book are written so that you may continue to believe. Now, it just doesn't say that you should believe once. It says that you should continue to believe. If you're a non-believer and you're here today and you trust Christ, it's to encourage you to continue to believe. If you're a believer and you're here, it's to encourage you to continue believing in Christ. Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you may have a life by the power of his name. Now, I want to talk to you for just a minute about this word believe. The word pastuo, the Greek dictionary, I looked it up this morning, and it says it's to be persuaded, to place full confidence in, to trust. Now, I could tell you the story of the guy that walks across the um, Niagara Falls. Pastor likes that story, but I'm going to choose to do it a little differently. So, to place full confidence in. So I got a chair, right? I know this is kind of lame, but it's what I got. And I haven't got Niagara Falls, and I'm not going on a wire. (laughs) So, I'm here, and I trust this chair is going to hold me up. Is it doing it? I put my faith in that. It's going to hold me up. Jesus is like that. I can put the full weight of my life, all my thoughts and my dreams, all my emotions and desires, my fears, my sins, my failures, my disappointments, my weaknesses, I can take all of it, the full weight of it on him. I must do that because you know what strength do I have in me? John 15, Jesus says, without me you can do nothing. I have zero strength in and of myself. But resting fully on Jesus, Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me as I trust him. Everything he needs for me to do, I can do it. Four times in the New Testament, it shares this verse. It says, the just shall live by faith. That's how we're supposed to live. Step by step. Each, each step along the way, we're to trust him. We're to have faith in Jesus. He gives us guidance through his word. He tells us what we need to know. Times we need to get counsel. And there's other believers for that. You know, life can be hard. And some of you may be here and you have physical illness or you have family trouble or you have a dark night of the soul where you're depressed, you're anxious, You're imprisoned by unforgiveness. You're angry at someone else or you're angry at God. Jesus is here today. He wants you to fully rest on him. Listen to the word. He wants you to get up and walk. He's got work for us to do. Trust him with your life. Even though it's difficult and it's discouraging at times, we need to trust him because he is good and he is God. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for these healings and John that uh, point out your true nature, that you're a merciful God. And thank you that you showed us mercy when we did not deserve it. We pray that you would help us to look to you in faith, to trust you each step, that we can honor you with our lives. We know that Jesus has already completely satisfied you. Help us to rest in that and help us to get up and walk for you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So without me... You can do, you can do through who? Amen. What a statement. Okay, I want you to pause here with me for a moment. What do you think is impossible? What do you think is impossible? Right now in your heart, what comes to you? 
as being impossible. Can Joni Erickson Tada have her spinal cord healed and walk? She can. It's possible. Will she? She will. Because her body will be made whole. He heals it all. She will. But it's God's time when it's right. It was the Sabbath day. Jesus could have used another day. But it was God's time that was right for what he is accomplishing in the world. It's God's time. Now, without me, you can do... That's your part. I'll get to the pause. That's your part. Without me, you can do... But you can do... Through... Who... Amen. In God's time, you will do what he intends you to do. And you will. And we'll do it by faith because with God, all things are possible. That's what Jesus said. With God, all things are possible. With man, this is impossible. With God, all things are possible. And our responsibility is to trust him, his time, his direction to us. Trust him. Trust him. You know, one thing this very week, I had an opportunity to talk with somebody who was struggling up a tree, spinning their wheels horribly up a tree. And the point I made was that you can't womp up trust. You have to grow into it. Just like you grow into your dad's shoes. You grow into it. To your father's. And we do this. We do this. We do this growing. Well, there's means. We've got that to cover. 